It says, it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men. I am uh, constantly amazed uh, by uh, religious uh, radio and television programs uh, that uh, kind of throw around the name of the Holy Spirit in their sermons and in their casual comments. For example, I hear a minister is introduced as one who has a powerful anointing of the Holy Spirit. Or another preacher tells a crowd that, well, the Holy Spirit's going to fill the building tonight. Or some evangelist claims that the Holy Spirit will be given out at his meeting. And when I hear this, I wonder if they are reading out of the same Bible that I'm reading out of. I wonder if they have ever read the book of Acts to begin with, and if so, have they never read Acts chapter 19, verses one to seven? Because if they did, they would learn some very important biblical facts about the Holy Spirit. Some facts I'd like to share with you tonight. Now, before I share these with you, I want to give you some background on this passage so we can keep an eye or we can keep our comments uh, in biblical context. So in the first century, people were aware of several kinds of uh, baptisms. For example, there was the baptism of John the Baptist. Before and for a short time during Jesus' appearance in ministry, John prepared the people for the Lord's coming. That was his role in history. He did this by preaching the coming of the kingdom and baptizing those people who repented and were readying themselves for this event. Get ready, he says, the kingdom is coming. Well, how do we get ready? Well, repent and be baptized, he would answer, and so they would be baptized in preparation for this event. Now, once Jesus appeared and began his ministry, John the Baptist's work was done and the people followed the Lord. Later on, as we know, John was killed by Herod. The second baptism, or another baptism, was of course the baptism of Jesus preached by the apostles. After his resurrection and ascension, the apostles continued to preach about baptism, but this time it was with the understanding that the kingdom was here. We weren't waiting for the kingdom, it was here. Jesus arrived, he established the kingdom. The Messiah had come. We weren't getting ready for the Messiah to come, the Messiah had come and done his work. Forgiveness of sin was now available now, not something to hope for in the future. You could receive that now. And that the Holy Spirit, promised long ago by the prophets at the coming of the Messiah, was now given to everyone not just men, not just prophets, not just kings or judges or special servants, but everyone could now have the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, that was the amazing thing on Pentecost Sunday. Yes, the Jews, the people who were listening to the apostles preach, they were familiar with the idea of baptism, but that they would receive the Spirit, everyone would receive the Spirit. Wow, that was news. That was the fulfillment of a tremendous promise made by the prophets. And of course, as we read in the book of Acts, all of these things were received by the individual who confessed their faith in Christ, who repented and was baptized in his name. Acts chapter two, verse 38. Now I'm looking at this card and I think everybody knows what that passage says. So as we go through the book of Acts, we see scene after scene of apostles and disciples preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and people responding, how? 
responding by being baptized. In Acts 2.41, the, the writer tells us that 3,000 people were baptized at the preaching of Peter. In Acts chapter 8, verse 13, Simon the sorcerer, he was baptized. In Acts 8.38, another example, the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, he was baptized uh, you know, based on the Philip's teaching and preaching, always the same reaction. Someone would hear the gospel, someone would hear the good news, and the reaction was they would be uh, baptized. Now when we get to Acts chapter 19, we meet a group of men, it says here there are about 12, in Ephesus, which is uh, modern day Turkey, and these men lived in a kind of a time warp. A time warp, let me explain. It was at least 20 years after Pentecost, uh, that this event takes place. 20 years since Peter's first sermon announcing the resurrection of Jesus, the offer of forgiveness and the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus for those who were baptized. And so Paul arrives in Ephesus. He finds that these good and sincere and religious men, he finds them and he questions them about their religious experience. During this discussion, he learns that they know nothing of the Holy Spirit. They didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Well, this is shorthand for saying that they did not know anything about the gospel message or the church or what had been preached now for at least 20 years. What had happened was that another teacher, probably we think Apollos, uh, and we read about him in Acts chapter 18, another teacher had taught them about God, about the coming Messiah, about the promises and the way to prepare for these things by being baptized with John's baptism, because they say we only receive John's baptism. Being sincere men, they did what they were told and they received John's baptism. This was all well and good, but the teaching was 20 years out of date. Paul realizes this when they answer that they have no knowledge of the Holy Spirit. So Paul builds on their outdated information, revealing that the Messiah has come, Jesus Christ, and he has resurrected, he is a witness of this. Uh, 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 true forgiveness of sins is now available, now, not in the future. And God gives his Holy Spirit to dwell in each believer to guarantee eternal life. Now they have the complete and up-to-date teaching that they needed. In addition to this, Paul explains that God requires faith in Jesus Christ to receive these gifts, and that faith is expressed in baptism, baptism in the name of Jesus. Not as a, a question of semantics, not as a requirement of ritual, but as the true and biblical way to respond to Jesus Christ's invitation to salvation. If you believe in Jesus, you are immersed in water calling on His name, not on the name of John the Baptist. We know this, but this was news to these men. Once again, these men want to please God. They want to do what God wants. So they, like thousands before them and millions after them, receive the baptism of Jesus for forgiveness of sins and consequently receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to notice that when Paul, the apostle, laid hands on them after they had been baptized, these same men also received the power from the Holy Spirit to speak in other languages. Speaking in tongues meant speaking in other languages that they hadn't learned, and also the ability to proclaim the word of God, to prophesy. This was given to them to provide a, a witness that what they had done in responding accurately to the gospel caused a profound and dynamic change in them. And note that uh, with John's baptism, they had no power to do any of these things. Now, not everyone who was baptized and received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit could speak in tongues or prophesy, but these did through the laying on of the hands of the apostle Paul. They uh, uh, received the ability 
to speak in tongues and to prophesy, to make the point that it was the baptism in Christ's name that was now legitimate and the other was not. Now, I've told you things that you know, but these, as I say, were things that they were learning. Well, there are some modern lessons that we can draw from this passage here in Acts chapter 19, verses one to seven. I think now that we understand the passage in context, Let's see how we can apply it to some modern situations concerning the teaching of the Holy Spirit. In other words, what does this passage teach us about the Holy Spirit and how we receive Him today? Couple of lessons and the sermon is yours. Lesson number one. The Holy Spirit is received at baptism. The Holy Spirit is received at baptism. I'll read that, that uh, uh, familiar passage here in Acts 2.38. Peter said to them, he's responding to the crowd after he's finished preaching. They say to him, men and brethren, what should we do? What do we do to be saved? And Peter says, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38. You know what? He could have said anything right here. Right here, he could have said anything at all. He could have said, jump up and down, raise your hands, uh, uh, accept Jesus into your heart. He could have given any command at this point, but what did he say to them? He said, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus, for what? For the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice the order, you're baptized, your sins are forgiven, you receive the Holy Spirit. It's so logical in a way. Would the Holy Spirit enter into an individual who's still guilty of their sins? Who is not sanctified, not purified by the blood of Christ? Of course not. First comes the cleansing, then the Spirit comes to dwell. Acts 2, 38. Note that the first question asked linked together the Holy Spirit and baptism. Now in Acts chapter 19, since these men knew nothing about the Holy Spirit, Paul immediately zeroed in on what he knew to be the problem. And what was that? Their baptism. You ever notice that? He asked them one question. Do you know anything about the Holy Spirit? And they say, oh, we don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. So what does he do? He zeroes in on baptism. He goes straight to baptism. Note that he didn't ask them about mystical experiences. He doesn't say to them, did you never have the anointing? Did the Spirit never fall on you? He didn't ask any of those questions. When they said they didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit, he asked them, what baptism did you have? Because he knew, as we know, that the reception of the Holy Spirit is linked to baptism. He knew that and he realized that they didn't. Notice also that he didn't question them about when they received the Holy Spirit. I hear that all the time. You know, people say, well, when did you receive the Holy Spirit? Well, it was on a Tuesday night and I was at a meeting or I was on a, I remember it was a Sunday morning and uh, the preacher had a really powerful sermon. I just felt the Spirit come in me. You know, everybody's got a different story about when they got the Spirit. And yet <laughs> the Bible's very clear about when you receive the Holy Spirit. And it gives us a, a, a story, a narrative that clarifies this just in case we didn't understand Acts 2.38, we get Acts 19, one to seven to really nail it down for us. Paul's question went directly to the heart of the matter. What baptism did you receive? Now there were several that existed at the time, as I mentioned, but there were others, the purification rites of the Jews, you know, they used water purification rites in many instances, not that kind of baptism or ritual. There were the secret religions of the pagans and many of these secret religions used a form of baptism in their, uh, in their uh, rites. You had to be baptized in a fast flowing river, uh, part of their cult. So that kind of baptism existed. And then of course, there was the baptism of John. And then of course, there was the baptism authorized by Jesus and preached by the apostles for the remission of sins and the reception of the Holy Spirit. 
It was the type of baptism they had that determined their condition as far as the Holy Spirit was concerned. If you had the ritualistic Jewish rites, you didn't receive the Spirit. If you had the mystical rites of pagan baptism, you didn't receive the Spirit. If all you had was John's baptism, you didn't have the Spirit. Paul educated them and said, the only baptism uh, that brings you the Spirit is the baptism in Jesus' name. And he clearly teaches us that. This was made abundantly clear, of course, when Paul went to the trouble of rebaptizing 12 men with the correct baptism. I mean, think about it. He could have said, ah, close enough, <laughs> good enough. You know, 12 guys, it's cold out, it's late. We, where are we going to find water? Close enough. He could have said, well, you know, you've had the right ritual, apparently. If you had John's baptism, you had immersion in water. You had the right ritual. And now you have the correct teaching about that ritual. You know, that it's in Jesus' name for the forgiveness of sin, reception of the Holy Spirit. Close enough, good enough. But he didn't do that, did he? He didn't do that. He went to the trouble of rebaptizing them because they didn't have the Holy Spirit. The proof is that only after they were baptized or they were rebaptized, um, uh, did he lay hands on them so that they could receive the power of the Holy Spirit. He could have laid hands on them right away, but he didn't. Why? Because they didn't have the indwelling yet. It doesn't matter what people claim. It doesn't matter what they say and it doesn't matter how famous they are because they say what they say. It doesn't matter how much you know, uh, lights and, 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 and sound and, and the crowd. It doesn't matter. Whether they say, well, I saw the Lord or the Lord spoke to me or they had a dream or they were anointed at church or they prayed to receive the Spirit or somebody laid hands on them so they could receive the Spirit or the Spirit came to them, fell on them, filled them, slayed them. It doesn't matter what they say. It only matters what this says. That's what matters when it comes to everything, but especially the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter what they say and what they felt. The Bible teaches in Acts 2.38 and then demonstrates in Acts 19, 1-7 that the Holy Spirit is only received to indwell the repentant believer at baptism. Nowhere else. It doesn't matter how moved you felt while listening to a sermon. That's not the indwelling of the Spirit. Lesson number two. There is only one effective baptism. You see, at one time, John's baptism was ordained by God and it was necessary for all believers to have. But later on, Paul writes in Ephesians 4 verse 5, there is only one Lord, there is only one faith, there is only one baptism. You know what? I have so many people that will argue this with me. Now they would never think of arguing there's only one Lord. No, of course not, there's only one Lord. No, never think of arguing that. Or one faith. No, no, there's only one faith, the Christian faith. You know, the, but they'll argue all day long about the one baptism. Why can't they accept there's only one baptism? How clearly does he have to, does he have to say this? John's baptism was superseded by the baptism commanded by Jesus, which not only bestowed forgiveness, like John's, but also granted the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The mode was the same, by immersion. The response was the same, faithful obedience. But the purpose and authority, however, was different. To simply, or excuse me, to, to, to signify burial and resurrection with Christ the Lord, that's what Jesus' baptism signified to infuse the believer with the Spirit of God. That's what the baptism of Jesus uh, effected. Now a parallel to this is when I, I had my picture taken for my uh, driver's license, and then I had my picture taken for my citizenship papers when I became uh, an American citizen. Some of you were here when that happened. We had a big party, you threw a big party for Lisa and I, remember I still have all the souvenirs that were given to us at that time when we became American uh, citizens. 
But think about you know, when I took my picture to get my driver's license and when I took my picture to get you know, my citizenship papers. The mode was the same. They took a photo of me. And the response was the same. I went to a government office in compliance with the law. But the purpose and the authority were different. One picture taking gave me the right to drive in this country. The other picture gave me the right to become part of this country by changing my status as a full-fledged citizen. Same mode, same sincerity, different outcome. Why? Because the authority that said this is going to accomplish this was different in both cases. One of them, the authority says, when you have your picture taken, you'll be able to drive a car. The other, the authority says, when you have your picture taken, you'll become an American citizen. John's baptism prepared you. It was the same, it was by immersion, it required obedience, it accomplished what? It accomplished the fact that you were prepared for the coming of Jesus. Jesus' baptism, by immersion in water, same thing, requires sincere obedience, same thing, except the results are different. You receive forgiveness of sin, and more importantly for our lesson tonight, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's not a perfect analogy, but it shows that similar procedures can yield vastly different results depending on the authority and the purpose behind the actions. Hmm. Now, if John's baptism can be voided and made of no value, even though at what time it was commanded by God himself for a specific time and purpose. Imagine how useless the endless variety of man-made religious practices can be. <laughs> if God can void one of his commands, imagine how useless man's commands are. My point is that if you don't receive the Holy Spirit through the once God-ordained baptism of John, then you certainly don't receive him through the sprinkling of a baby or the sinner's prayer or the altar call or the laying on of hands by some bishop or the tarrying all night long of the spirit to come. These things all sound very spiritual. They're just not biblical. The Bible teaches and demonstrates ever so clearly that the Holy Spirit is given when one receives the baptism of Christ. Not before, not any time after. All right, third lesson here, given to us uh, by this uh, passage. Obedience trumps sincerity. A teaspoonful of obedience is more effective and desirable in God's eyes than an ocean of sincerity. I know, some say, wow, that's harsh. Yeah, it's harsh, but it's true. From Adam to Saul to Esther to Mary to Paul to every Christian who has ever confessed the name of the Lord, this lesson has been hammered home time and time and time again. God wants us to obey. But what about sincerity, someone will say. Well, the role of sincerity is that it defines the kind of obedience that you offer to the Lord. In other words, God wants obedience, but what kind of obedience? He wants sincere obedience, the kind that is honest and heartfelt and true and legitimate, sincerity. Acts 19 is a case in point. If there is ever an example of sincere obedience, this is it. These men were sincere when they received the baptism of John. They did it for God. They, they, they thought sincerely that they had done what he wanted, considered themselves disciples. But Acts chapter 19 shows us that they were wrong. They were sincere, but they were wrong. Their sincerity was commendable, but obedience to the Lord was what brought them the Holy Spirit. Their sincerity led them to obey God's word when they understood their mistake. Some think this is a form of legalism or salvation by works. I am sure after this video you know, goes online, we're going to get a lot of, <laughs> get ready, going to get a lot of mail for our question and answer man here, Mr. Marty, going to get a lot of mail about this. You guys are all legalists, you know, you're Pharisees. You know. Why? Because I teach that we ought to obey God? 
The Bible clearly shows that God has always required that faith be expressed through obedience, not sincerity or feelings. Ask Abraham about that. Ask Saul about that. Ask David, ask Jesus. He obeyed until death. So this lesson has focused in large part on obedience how obedience to God's word yields great rewards. Even the presence of God himself within us through the Holy Spirit. The final question as we close out the lesson tonight, as well as our day is, have you obeyed the truth? Never mind what you think you've done or what others have told you, can you say in all sincerity that you have obeyed God's word when it comes to the forgiveness of sin and the reception of the Holy Spirit? My appeal to you is if you haven't, then show the sincerity of your faith by obeying God's word today. And you know, that, that isn't just when it comes to baptism. Of course it does then, that's the very beginning of our faith, but that's all throughout our faith, all throughout our life. We show the sincerity of our faith through our obedience. That is the prime way that we show God, that we love Him. If you love me, Jesus says, you'll do what? You'll obey me. O obedience is the currency of spiritual uh, sincerity. So if you haven't, then show the obedience of your faith by obeying God's word today, whether that is to be baptized or to be restored or to be strengthened in faith or to give up some thought, some ideas, some teaching, some attitude, whatever it is. And of course, because we're gathered together with the saints and the elders are here, if you have a need for public prayer, if you have a need to confess Christ publicly, then we can do that this evening. And we encourage you to think about that and consider what your response may be as we stand and as we sing uh, a song of encouragement.